question number one. What do you suggest students to do if they want to practice pushing machine learning models to production? Okay, well, this is a, a great, interesting starter question because it's a, it's a bit more specific than how do you just get started in machine learning, but rather how do we uh, put machine learning models in production? A skill that uh, isn't necessarily taught in universities and isn't necessarily something people even with my background in, in research have a lot of experience with and that we, for a large period between when I started working on deep learning around 2012 and really until I, I got back into startup land, the scale was handled by engineers who were far more capable um, than I was. But with the sort of Cambrian explosion of machine learning uh, libraries and frameworks that uh, really democratize access to this, so too has there been a sort of wave of people going straight out of undergraduate, dropping out from PhD programs, going into industry, you know, starting their startups. And I feel like the field craft and ML ops and how to be able to sort of actually deal with efficiency, deal with organizing your data, deal with versioning your models so that you could organize a business around ML as a first class citizen has really sort of grown so quickly um, at, at a point where I had a hard time keeping up with it. So this is not an area of expertise with, but fortunately people who do, who have developed this expertise firsthand have, a lot of them have put time into publishing you know, courses and blog posts and books. One that um, I'm reading right now to learn about this aspect, um, since I obviously have to understand this aspect of, of things also within Cohere, even though it's not my expertise, is uh, Chip Huyens. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name uh, correctly, um, uh, who, taught, um, who taught one of the courses at Stanford on MLOps, uh, has put out a wonderful book a few months ago called Designing machine learning system, an iterative process for production ready applications, which covers kind of for me the whole stack in a very production oriented manner. Um, so I really would recommend starting with that book. I'm not making royalties or, or commission from it. It just happens to be at my bedside. Um, I'm sure there are other resources um, out there that are uh, equivalently or perhaps differently useful. Uh, so I really recommend just using Google or your favorite search engine and, and finding resources out there, but what's sure is that there's a lot more information out there than the last time I had to learn about this sort of stuff where it was figuring out by yourself and no one really knew how to do things. Awesome. Recommendation duly noted. Thank you so much for this. Uh, we have the first live question coming from the Q&A section. Prane, please go ahead. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask what NLP use cases you're most interested in and what you find interesting in the realm of NLP. So personally, the the main thing that's exciting me today, uh, a lot of things excite me within language in that it's it's the main you know, tool by which we not just communicate, but you know make plans, transact, record information for ourselves, for others. Uh, aid our memory. So all these use cases are, are fascinating. The thing I find absolutely fascinating in terms of technological progress in just the last few months, and certainly the last week, is conversational intelligence. So the ability of uh, unified models to um, not just carry on open-ended conversation as we see with Jet, Chat GPT or Google's Lambda or, um, or Facebook's, or sorry, Meta, uh, Blender Bot 3, but to increasingly interact with the world in meaningful ways uh, and to show different fortes across these, these three models I, I mentioned. For example, Lambda can interface with um, APIs that can search the web or operate a calculator, uh, demonstrating a really interesting form of groundedness that's also reflected in uh, Blender Bot 3. And in contrast, what we've seen with OpenAI's um, GPT chat or chat GPT, I never remember which order around it. It's clear that they've built on top of the strength of their, their codex um, model uh, in, in understanding um, code as a modality. And, and it's a fantastic tool for interacting with knowledge surrounding code, with code itself, editing code, getting recommendations about how to produce code. And these all point to a sort of inflection point where this class of technology, which previously was, I think, quite niche, like people had a hard time getting conversational, open-ended conversational bots that were able to do more than just chit-chat off the ground. It's a turning point where 
we're finally seeing the potential for really broad applications for these being a central sort of entry point to a number of tools, to a number of application cases. So I'm really excited to see this domain um, develop over the next few months. And obviously we're, we're keen participants in this ourselves, which hopefully with some exciting stuff to announce in the, in the coming months. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, Pranay, let me just move on because we have lots of questions coming. So next one is from Jan. Jan, do you want to ask yourself? Oh yeah, hello. Um, uh, I was just wondering uh, what deep learning framework among PyTorch, TensorFlow, Jax, perhaps others, Cohere uses and why as well. So like what are the different trade-offs between different frameworks that you think about? The um, so I, I myself have worked with PyTorch for many years, um, for about three years at, during my time at Fair, and before that worked with um, Lua Torch and TensorFlow 1.0 when I was at DeepMind. At Cohere, we use Jax internally, and the primary reason for that is that our compute is obtained in partnership with Google, so we have access to a large number of TPUs, and Jax is the the best framework for for getting the most out of TPUs themselves. Um, I think if we were in a situation where we were operating with a large number of GPUs, um, we would probably consider something like PyTorch instead, which has better performance on GPUs, and especially with the release of PyTorch 2.0 announced, announced last week, um, has further sort of like a, a potential for optimization for large scale models that would be very appealing. So for us, it's a pragmatic decision that's primarily directed by what hardware we have access to. Um, if you, if hardware isn't, uh, hardware and efficiency isn't your primary concern, then I think it boils down really to sort of, uh, how much the relative features of these languages matter. So if you want to do higher order derivatives or something that's a bit more mathematically fancy up until about a year or so ago, Jax was the obvious choice because it just built on top of NumPy and made everything differentiable. And it was very convenient to use this VMAP abstraction to, to not have to explicitly reason about batches. Um, but now there's Funk Torch. I haven't played with it directly, um, but uh, I have the impression that that starts to get feature parity in terms of flexibility um, with Jack. So again, if, if, yeah, if hardware isn't your, um, your priority, there's, there's, there's more about those features. For most businesses focusing on large models, it's always going to be about efficiency and hardware, and there the choice is pretty easy. GPUs you use um, for training. Um, you use PyTorch, and for if you have TPUs, you use Jackson. Then for inference, you use, you know, uh, you can use C plus plus or you know Onyx or a number of different sort of um, different frameworks. Very comprehensive. Thank you so much, Jan, for the question. Thanks, and for the answer. Next up is Aidan with a bunch of questions. Aidan, you're allowed to answer the first question or any of your questions of, of the group of questions you have. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, two questions are, or I, I get, okay, so one is really fast. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? <laughs> At the risk of sounding boring, I really, I really like vanilla. Um, I like, I like chocolate. I like. Um, Cookie, um, cookie dough as well, cookie dough and chocolate. But vanilla is great because I like toppings on top of ice cream, and so vanilla is like a blank canvas, and you can just, like, <laughs> you know, you can, yeah, thanks, and you can just, um, you can just add stuff to it. In fact, as an anecdote in terms of what you can add to, to vanilla, we had a, a hackathon this this summer where our Brazilian interns, and this will segue, I guess, to your questions about internships, uh, our Brazilian interns formed a team where they used our large language models. Uh, prompted by a number of recipes to generate new recipes, and then they they <laughs> they made them. And one of them was a dessert that involved red wine and vanilla ice cream, which kind of vanilla ice cream with red wine cocktail, which you wouldn't imagine works, but in a very strange way, kind of did or didn't make us sick. So um, yeah, vanilla really is the canvas upon which you can put any paint, even if it sounds unreasonable. I think the weirdest ice cream flavor I've had is like balsamic and strawberry, which turned out pretty well actually. I've had mar I've had marmite and vanilla ice cream. That was, that was that was pretty weird too. Yeah, some things aren't necessarily made to be combined, but you know you can try. <laughs> uh, yeah. So my uh, longer question is, how do you decide like what technology and what research advances uh, in ML you choose to share with the community compared to keeping like a company's competitive advantage? Like you know what is considered significant enough or important enough that needs to be shared compared to, oh, this is something that will make my model slightly better, which will give me like the edge over, you know, 
Google or OpenAI or whatever? Well, I think right now the landscape in large scale language modeling is very data directed. So like, I like to think that we should reach a point where we're comfortable sharing any sort of innovation we're doing on the modeling front or the training front. And in fact, perhaps even the modeling code with the community because our competitive advantage lies in the data and how we use it. And obviously I think we'll have to realistically keep something you know, to ourselves so that we can keep that competitive advantage and that there's our existence as a company is driven by having something to offer for which we can take profit. But we don't necessarily benefit from significant secrecy when it comes to any of the techniques we're developing. And in fact, we can help showcase our potential for innovation rather than just implementing other people's modeling techniques by doing so. So we're very eager to both innovate and share the product of that innovation with the broader community. This aligns quite well, I think, with how things worked at Facebook Air Research, where I worked before, and to a certain extent at DeepMind, but which was a bit more secretive. Um, but at Facebook Air Research, the idea was we really want to open source everything we're doing, release everything we're doing. If the business is going to take any value out of it, it's from having the experts in house to sort of advise on how things can be adapted to, to be business facing. So I think some of the same reasoning can apply here. We want to build the best models possible and then have those be available to our customers, users, developers to build astounding language technologies. And that's our competitive edge, not necessarily how we produce the models. Cool. Um, and yeah, I'm sure you already read the third question. Um, just go um, here. I'm sorry. Well, I'll, I'll answer that last question know. very quickly. We okay. are taking My internships. Bad, we can you can apply on the careers web page. Um, I'm sure Sandra can and put post the link after this. You will be guided. Thank you so much. Sorry for taking up so much time. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Okay, next up is Sarah. Thank you so much. I don't mean, I am excited to ask my question, but I think maybe Alan's question is a good question to go before mine. Um, I think it'll provide good context. Let's do Alan's first then. Okay, let's do Alan's then. Yeah, so um, I guess, yeah, mine is a little bit more abstract or philosophical, uh, but I'm very interested in uh, what you would define as a threshold of artificial general intelligence, and how long do you think it'll be before we get there? Um, I am a bit skeptic. Well, okay, first, I'll preface this by saying that AGI means a lot of different things to different people. So I can't yeah. dismiss AGI completely in the sense that some people will have a very moderate view of what it means that probably is in line with what I find what I find reasonable. But I don't believe that there's an unboundedly general intelligence that's possible just because I think it's a contradiction. So um, we're humans aren't general intelligences, for example, right? We are geared towards being good at particular ways of learning and making decisions that are the byproduct of our evolutionary history and therefore a byproduct of the constraints under which we have to operate in the world, right? We can't communicate, we can't memorize unboundedly long sentences. We don't communicate with unboundedly long sort of like phrases because we need to make decisions under particular sort of like time frames, or we'll starve or a bear will eat us or, you know, in modern society, you know, uh, we'll just fail to sort of make any productive advances. And so all of these sort of constraints and pressures from our environment have formed within us through evolutionary pathways, but also through meta-evolution meta within society, strong biases towards what we're, where we're good at adapting and what we're not good at, right? For example, a calculator is undoubtedly better than us at doing rapid calculations just because we don't have any evolutionary need to do, you know, 10 digit calculation in our head, but we are good at doing very rapid pattern matching and deciding things, you know, kind of like well enough, doing good enough estimates of, of small sets of numbers, just because that allows us to, you know, expend very little energy cognitively and otherwise and making these decisions. So I think the same sort of thing applies to when you're talking about general intelligence, like more general intelligence is like, there's always some point where you have to bias it towards a particular class of problems. Because if you take the abstract space of all the possible sort of like problems that you solve, some are in strong opposition to, to each other, where solving one 
and you can come up with very artificial examples here, and I I'll, I'll, won't do that in the interest of time, but you can come up with one class of problems where being optimal at solving those makes you, you know, uh, almost inversely suboptimal at solving an, an, a, another side, another class of problems. So it's, for me, inconceivable that there's a general learner that's, you know, jointly optimal at doing both of those things. And in a very hand-wavy sense, this has the connection to no free lunch theorems, but I'm not, I'm not an I'm not a uh, expert at optimization theory, so I'm not going to pretend that that's a ground truth. I think that's more of like a hunch. Uh, in a recent paper uh, that we um, called uh, General Intelligence Requires Rethinking Exploration that I wrote with my student, Minchi Jiang, uh, we talk about increasingly general intelligence, which I think is a more plausible sort of notion, in that we definitely want to come up with methods that in an open domain, in an open learning open-ended learning setting, force our agents and our models to be increasingly um, increasingly general over, iterative, over learning iterations. But that's always under the view of there being some sort of like formed cone of bias set by the environment under which we're, we're generalizing that obviously balance the generality of the system. That didn't answer your question directly, but the short answer is I don't think AGI exists so that it doesn't make sense to talk about when it arrives or what the threshold is. I hope that that seems like an appropriate excuse. Yeah, I think so. It, it sets a pretty high bar, higher than I'm usual for AGI. So I guess I, like on a practical level, I was just more interested in, do you think uh, AI is going to be smarter than the, the average human? And when's that going to happen? <laughs> uh, 2050. There we go. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Alan and Sarah. Here we go. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, because now that makes I can ask a better question now that I understand yeah. how you think of AGI, um, which is, you know, to I guess a two parter, which is how much do you think that the current uh, deep learning, machine learning, neural net learning approaches, despite being called that, like how much do you actually think that parallels natural systems, neurobiological systems? And do you think that it matters like do you think having system technical technical systems that operate more like that sensory based intuitive limited human capacity is something worth exploring or is it better for us to just focus on big you know prediction and calculation tools which are obviously far better than we are at doing such things so on the first on the first point about biological possibility, first I'm definitely the wrong person to ask this. So I grew up in, in in France and had to do the scientific baccalaureate, which requires you to do amongst other things physics, mathematics, and biology. And the, my biolo my biology paper was my worst in the set. So <laughs> I can, I'm barely confident when it comes to sort of even talking about biological plausibility. <laughs> All I can say is, you know, we we don't build planes to fly like birds, and so it's fine for things to be obtaining the same sort of like abstract functionality without necessarily replicating the same functional mechanisms. Um, so to that end, I personally, I'm interested in whether or not, you know, um, back prop happens in the brain or not. Like those are things as, as a hobbyist, as a, as an outsider almost to that debate, I find it quite fascinating. And I, you know, I was entertained and, and, and stimulated by Jeff Hinton's keynote at NeurIPS uh, on trying to think about learning methods that are more biologically plausible. Um, but I don't think it's essential for us to, to seek that. Um, do I think, I mean, the part of your, pro your question was also, do I think just deep learning as a framework gets us to the level of human intelligence? Sorry, am I, am I, am I, am I projecting that question onto what well, you Well, no, asked? that was my original question, but now yeah. that I understand how you think about it, I guess I'm my, my other question is more, do you think it's worth a technical pursuit of a more kind of human learning with all right. of our failings and fouls, you know. I mean, oil. I think like rather than focusing on the biological problems, I like to think about like what are aspects of our own learning pathways that we might want to replicate on the functional mm -hmm. level, like how we memorize things, how we try and incorporate information in the short and long term. These are, you know, nice things to sort of try and reason about when we're building. Uh, artificial systems. I think a large part of my earlier machine learning career um, around the time I, I was in deep mind was on like differentiable neural computers, neural pushdown automata, where we were trying to, you know, join the algorithmic world, the reasoning about memory and short-term and long-term planning world into like the architectural level of how we build neural networks. 
Um, I still think that's an interesting area to, to, to push and it just like, you know, large scale models tended to produce better extrinsic results in practical real world tasks. So that kind of kneecapped that whole line of work. But um, I still think there's a lot of inspiration to be taken from looking at how humans plan what we're good at and what we're poor at if what if what we're looking to do is produce systems that reason at some abstract level in a similar way to us so that we have a better chance of getting them to align with our biases with our uh, strengths and weaknesses and you know supplement us perhaps but it's not necessary that we exclusively focus on that in artificial intelligence in fact it's beneficial to also consider the design of artificial systems that highly complement us. And to be frank, the invention of the calculator, which I mentioned earlier, is, is a great example of this. It's something that does something very well that we're bad at. <laughs> at least some people, most people are bad at, like doing uh, 10, 15 digit multiplication. Um, but, uh, and therefore it's useful, but it's, it's also terrible at doing things that we're good at. So the calculator hasn't immediately made us all irrelevant. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can I just ask you to repeat the name of the paper that you referenced, the author of the paper about natural learning? Um, you mentioned someone who wrote a paper about how we could make... Uh, um, how we can... Uh, oh, Jeff, Jeff Hinton, at the, the, his keynote at NURPS. Oh, um, okay, cool. Yes. Thank uh, you. I'm sure that'll be online and in video form soon. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Awesome, Ed. We have a next, next question, but before that, I want you guys to remember to ask your questions in the Q&A section and upvote the questions that you would like to be asked. And next up uh, will be Ethan. Ethan, are you with us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right, first I wanna say thank you so much for having this Q&A and speaking this day, we really appreciate it. Um, my question in particular is, I read a lot of work talking about how people have just been increasing the scale of neural networks, making them larger, more data, more model parameters. And some people say we can continue doing that and we'll continue to reap benefits. And other people are saying we need to introduce other types of systems, some things along the lines of like symbolic based artificial intelligence to supplement that. And I was curious how much you think we can continue scaling deep learning models before we need to start doing other things. Yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, I'll answer, I'll answer it in perhaps in a slightly more general sense by starting by declaring, which was gonna be a very counterintuitive thing to say perhaps, that I don't actually believe that our current large language models and that the way we're training large language models and transformer architectures are going to bring us all the way to human level language understanding, which seems like a very strange thing to say, working for a company, which is at least in present, predicated upon doing this. And, and I'll explain what I mean before everyone thinks I've gone rogue and cuts me off, <laughs> is um, it, if you start from this intuition, there's really three ways you can try and advance things or you know operate right and the first is to just you know stick to your intuition that okay it's not gonna it can never really work it's just kind of working now but and just be a contrarian and I'm, I'm not singling or sub sub tweeting in person any specific person in our community but um you know who you are uh but the um <laughs> like being a contrarian is great but it's it's not the most constructive way to sort of necessarily move the die on the field even if you're even if you happen to be right, even if you have a healthy skepticism, and it's always good to be a bit skeptical. The second is to say, okay, I'm skeptical, but I'm going to produce, I'm going to try and produce a testable hypothesis, which is the basis of a scientific method in the form of a benchmark that seeks to, you know, illuminate a particular failure mode of the current paradigm, right? It says, like, I don't believe that language models are going to, you know, in their current for incarnation, you know, exhibit uh, quality X, which is uh, convincingly and extrinsically, you know, useful or 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 uh, an essential part of like human communication, for example. 
And the difficult, this has been kind of the bread and butter of machine learning for the last decade, at least, as people develop benchmarks, the community rallies around trying to sort of produce training or model changes that improve upon the benchmarks. You get soda, you get your ICML paper, hooray. Um, and, but that is sort of like slow and gradual process. And so it's a, it's a healthy way to engage in, in scientific progress in an engineering discipline. The problem with this is that the complexity of the behavior that language models exhibit and can be in the situations they can be deployed in has reached a degree to which it's very difficult to design benchmarks that appropriately find reliable, robust failure modes that reflect the diversity in which um, of the, uh, the diversity of the manners in which they can be interacted with or used. Um, there's still a place for benchmarks, obviously. My student, Laura, Laura Reese, has recently put out uh, a fantastic paper on a benchmark that tests whether or not large language models can understand um, conversational implicature, a form of pragmatics, and we find that they can, so that there's, you know, progress to be made there. But in practice, this brings us to the third way of, like, you know, being a skeptic, which is, Let's just try and build cool stuff with the technology and see where it fails in the real world. It's the most unforgiving benchmark of, of all, like the diverse way in which users are going to try and mess with your model, get it to fail just by virtue of trying to get utility from it. And, um, and it happens to also be the sort of <laughs> way of addressing this problem where you can also make a lot of money. So it's, it's great that you can align, you know, the scientific method and, um, you know, financial incentives in such a way. Now, obviously, if your model fails to sort of land with the public and find utility, that's in itself not a sufficient negative case uh, or sufficient case for the negative thesis, because, you know, you could have had poor product market fit, you could have marketed it improperly, you could have just not advertised, you know, the, the qualities of your model sufficiently, and that's why it didn't connect with users. But it, once you start having sort of users engage with your model in real world applications, the signal you get from that about what it's good at, where more progress is needed, and what the sort of eventual critical failure mode, if it exists, is, you really have a firsthand um, opportunity to see that, and then obviously, hopefully fix it so that you can continue to add value and continue to sort of operate as a as a company and 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 push the the boundaries of technology and in this sense cohere is really like a fantastic place to work <laughs> to plug my employer here because if you're working at deep mind or if you're working at, at, at facebook ai research right some of the smartest people in the world work there it's a great environment to do research it's very difficult to put anything you're building in front of customers, right? It's like if you have a really great idea and you go to, you know, Google and you say, I want some cross-functional collaboration, even if your idea is great and and economically valuable, like these companies and are 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 big. They're they're incentivized to be conservative, to not rock the boat too much with their current revenue models, and to just really slowly and, and carefully integrate new technology in, in their user-facing sort of offering. Conversely, you can work at a startup, which you know they're at, at an earlier stage where, of course, you can put things in front of users, but you don't necessarily have the resources computational and otherwise, and then in terms of engineering support to build things at a very large scale. And Cohere and OpenAI and a few other places are are there are very few places where you both have, you know, this immediacy of being able to like turn research ideas and put them in front of users in order to get that tight feedback loop and the resources engineering and computational to be able to build things at scale. So um, I'm really, this on the basis of my skepticism, I think Cohere is like a fantastic place to be working for me to address this fundamental question. Specifically, you mentioned scale. So I, I, I'll add one sentence there. I too am skeptical about like where scale is going to give us. I don't think we can just scale the data and scale the models, but it keeps on working. So in line with my earlier response, we're going to really want to find the failure mode before we start thinking about how we, how to fix it. Got it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ethan, for your question. Thanks, Ed. I agree. Cohere is an awesome place to work on stuff. <laughs> um, next question is coming from Dwayne. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Ed. Since uh, this is an AMA, my question totally leans into the anything category. Um, and it's it's pretty niche question for the industry that I work in, which is the news industry. Uh, and I am curious, Ed, uh, if you've had any sort of daydreams or, or, or passing thoughts as you're consuming some, what I'd say, sort of good reputable news to start with that, um, you know, ML might have applications for in order to, to help us improve trust and legitimacy for, for the consumers that read our content? That's an interesting question. I, I haven't really 
I mean, I thought about the question about trust in the news and and, and observe that over the last four to eight years, um, the, the a, a very <laughs> human problem has emerged where people have lost trust in our new in news and institutions and misinformation before we worry about like machines producing it is already amply produced by humans um, and and for the harms that trust. So I'm not an expert in this particular domain, but I do have the confidence that as we have um, systems that uh, increasingly understand, and I use scare quotes because they're, they're, they're mimicking understanding or the jury's out as to whether or not this is aligning with the actual mechanism by which humans understand. But we, if you allow the anthropomorphization, we have systems that increasingly understand and can explain or generate or reference uh, linguistic information and linguist and information containing other modalities and pictures, et cetera. And we build products that, you know, allow you to search, to like converse uh, and, uh, you know, operate over these modalities um, that this will allow us to build tools that will automatically, you know, extract, for example, you know, given a news article, here are other reliable news sources or, or, or sources of information that, you know, are, um, uh, congruent or aligned with the information being produced there, and here are information in here are some news sources that you might consider in opposition, and at least kind of synthesize, you know, uh, where the the fault lines lie and where the what the what the sources of information are, so that people don't feel like they have this tunnel vision view of like their favorite newspaper tells them X Y Z, and that's all they're going to look at, uh, but rather can very easily without much sort of cognitive load, aggregate information from several sources and make a more educated decision about whether or not they trust, you know, a particular news source. That said, you can give people the best tool in the world in this nature. Um, you're still going to be fighting against the natural human bias to sort of like stick with your team, to stick with, you know, people you trust and to sort of reject evidence, even if, even if it's like well argued. So I don't think it's going to be a panacea, but I'm eager to think about how people are going to integrate the sort of technology we're building into trying to, I guess, distill information in a explainable way such that people can at least explore the possibility that their favorite news source isn't necessarily trustworthy or better yet reinforce the idea that they're not just believing their trusted news source because they live in a bubble, but because that information is consistent with what, you know, the other news sources are saying. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Ferris. Do we want to ask your question or shall I do that for you? Let me do it for you then. Um, so Ferris is asking, speaking of biological systems, are you designing any systems that have human in the loop, sort of hybrid systems? Yeah, so when it comes, one popular topic right now in uh, large scale language model training is learning from human feedback. Um, so OpenAI, I've been working a lot on this aspect, um, in particular with their move from DaVinci 2 to DaVinci 3. Um, and our, we are, we're definitely looking into this. Um, our core belief right now is that collecting data, for example, uh, OpenAI have used this primarily to uh, train excellent um, instruction following models. So models rather that operate by continuing a sequence of text or a sequence of like inductive reasoning, uh, rather for them to be good at just taking instructions in a very natural form, like write me a poem about this or like tell me about that. And that's the basis of a lot of the models we're seeing now, including I believe Chad GPT. Um, so they've trained that with initially just by collecting a lot of instructions and their the, the sort of like completion of those instructions and, 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 and training against that data in a supervised format. Um, and then sort of augmented that with um, human in the, sort of human in the loop, slightly asynchronous human in the loop, um, RL from human feedback, where they col they collect feedback about like two proposed con continuations that the model gives, given a prompt, and then ranking that, you, trying to rank in, in alignment with how humans would rank in order to be able to sort of train, uh, the, further train the model when you have a bunch of prompts, but you don't have necessarily the gold standard responses from annotators. I like that paradigm a lot. I think it's it's it definitely makes a lot of sense. Our current design philosophy is to think let's focus on like 
actually just getting core data from initially from annotators purely and then from annot further annotation of how people are interacting with our models and then just continue supervised learning focusing more on the diversity of our data and focusing more on you know the quality of that data and see how far that gets us before we try uh, reinforcement learning uh, or a similar method um, this might seem as a surprise for me to say, given I've been working a lot at reinf on reinforcement learning, both with my group at UCL and uh, in my prior sort of work at Facebook AI Research, but I'm a big uh, fan of, of pragmatics like and, and of being sort of uh, conservative with the degree of complexity you add to your learning mechanism. So we have a pretty reasonable approach, which is see how well a simple method scales um, and then add, add complexity on the algorithmic front. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for um, answering the first question. Now we have a question coming from Jean-Pierre. Oh, hi. Uh, it's a long question, so... <laughs> Try to keep it short, please, if possible. We have more questions coming. I've been studying deep learning uh, during my master's degree, and it looked to me that it's uh, mapping, very extensive, smart mapping. And when you look at human beings or even uh, nature, it's all hierarchical. Like uh, the body is made of organs, an eye is made of an iris, and so and so on. A cat is uh, has four legs and a head. So it seems that we model reality and information like a, a hierarchical structure, uh, objects, and then uh, we learn the properties of those objects. So it's really easy for us. Like you never seen a cat running and then you see a cat running, you just update the property. Um, so I was wondering, maybe I'm wrong, but are there any people who do this today? Is there research in that area? Because in Transformers, you have like some levels of hierarchy, but they are not defined in terms of the objects that people use every day in language or in, then, in their uh, inner in mind. Yeah, I mean, so... You know, deep learning is a very broad and wide field now. And so there certainly are a number of project areas that work on interpretability, not just of the output, but of like the intermediate representations. There's been a lot of work uh, between 2014 and 2017, so around that time, on trying to, um, as I said, produce uh, neural architectures that have um, more. Uh, mechanistically if not biologically inspired kind of structures like differentiable neural computers differentiable stacks or cues uh, neural gpus where we're doing continuous relaxation of like discrete architectures and so you can sort of think about what's happening at the intermediate levels as manipulating bits of information and and trying to compose them and that that's been a very interesting sort of research program um Separately, there's also been um, work on sort of neurosymbolic methods where there are uh, in the somewhere in the system, there are uh, things collapse onto interpretable symbols and the, the neural network components manipulate those symbols or operate on, on them as an intermediate layer. And again, there's a large body of research on this, including work I did with Richard Evans on differentiable prolog interpreters. Um, but the to go back to your foundational question, I, I don't think it's it's wrong to say that just standard deep learning as we do it today, like taking very large scale transformers, aren't also capable of learning um, uh, hierarchy implicitly by virtue of doing something like mapping. I mean, so when you're learning a machine learning, when you're learning a large, when you're learning a large network against your data, you are learning a mapping, right? You're learning a function. Every function is a mapping from input to output. Um, the idea is that by having enough data and sufficient, a uh, sufficiently expressive model, the best way of explaining the training data is to actually implicitly induce um, the uh, some degree of compositional substructure within the data, and then exploiting that in order to extrapolate well. So the only explanation that I could find plausible for why these neural networks exhibit compositionality as in that you can run them and explain data that you haven't seen during training time is that this is exactly what has happened during training. The statistic amortization has induced within the network something like a hierarchy. Is it interpretable? No, but is it there? It must be in some form. If not, they would just have completely fit the training data and not be able to explain held out data. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Jean-Pierre, for your question. Thanks Ed, for your answer. Um, we have a question coming from Adrian Ziegler. Next. Uh, yeah, hi there. Uh, so mine, mine is a bit more applied. So how do you think about prompt engineering uh, versus fine tuning or also like some alignment methods such as instruct GPT uh, when it comes to using an LLM for a specific use case? So that's a, that's a great question and it's it's very relevant to our current uh, strategy now and I'm, I'm happy to to talk about it a bit. So prompt engineering is a is a fascinating mechanism by which we can interact with language models whether they're general ones or even slightly more specific ones, which is to say, let's exploit the fact that they take text as a modality and use text to condition kind of what the, the rest of the generation is gonna look like. And you can see that as just trying to sort of, you know, take something general and get it to act in a specific way. People like it because it doesn't require actually understanding how the models were trained or further training of the model or any sort of programming. So it's been a very intuitive way for developers to, to uh, interact with large scale language models and get them to do things like, you know, act like a summarization engine, um, you know, act like a chatbot. Um, so that's super cool. Where it starts to fail, if you take the most general models, even very good ones, is, you know, you might obtain something that acts like a summarization engine or something that acts like a chatbot, and it's going to work sort of like 95% of the time. And if that's good enough for your product, then you just stick to prompt engineering. But in practice, for a lot of sort of business critical cases, what you want is like things to work 99.5% of the time. And then, you know, to get that sort of robustness, to get that sort of like highly specialized behavior, fine tuning is the solution that we typically engage in. We find data that reflects the downstream application. Um, and and we, we, we train on it. But obviously, as you go towards specificity using fine tuning, you lose a lot of the generality. So if you fine tune too far towards a specific use case and someone wants something in the neighborhood of that use case, you've you kind of like trained yourself out of the generality that would have allowed that rapid adaptation. So a lot of what we're doing, and I think a lot of what the field is gonna start exploring is figuring out what the sweet spot is between specificity and you know general applicability. Like how can we train something that's domain specific enough that it's like commercially applicable, but in a more constrained way where we can still prompt it to have specific behaviors that will, you know, in, in, for one prompt help business A more, for one another prompt help business B, and obviously let the businesses themselves determine what these prompts are with some guidance from us. Um, Exploring the space is a difficult task, but it's really kind of our, our raison d'etre right now. So um, we're, we're, we're pretty thick into it. Awesome, thank you so much. Actually, Anne has a similar question, similar-ish question, follow-up question. So um, Alan, go ahead. Yeah, I guess for me, this is just such an exciting time because it seems like every few weeks, uh, there's another really large uh, language model and they just keep getting better and bigger and, and, and more options. So it's, it's utterly fantastic. But I guess I'm curious on, on your perspective on how the whole industry will adapt to this. Do you see that some of these models will become increasingly specialized in various ways? So we'll see very diverse ways to use these uh, different uh, tools, or is it more like a, a winner take all where the biggest, best, smartest uh, models will dominate? And so I'm really interested in your view on that as well as you know, how do you see Cohere fitting into, uh, you know, that competitive space? What's your niche or role or how do you believe you'll you'll stand out? So, I mean, so with regard to whether there's going to be a winner takes all, I mean, I hope not <laughs> because OpenAI have a, head, a pretty big, big head start on, on everyone else. Um, and if it was that simple, that would be great for them. And also very, a very interesting moment for the field because, to really take it all, you'd have to have a general model that is so robust that you know everyone just wants to use it rather than try and you know find some sort of like specialized model or something that works better in another domain. In practice, what I'm seeing from you know what they've put out with GPT-3 and I guess GPT-3.5 is, is is what is unofficially un underpinning. Um, chat GPT. Um, these are really powerful and great models. Uh, they're in line with some of the progress we've seen within Google and with within within uh, within Facebook. All these models have really clear strengths, but also very clear failure modes. And uh, I don't necessarily believe that any of these companies will be able to, you know, address all the failure modes as fast enough or all the strengths or or capitalize on all the strengths fast enough that they will 
focus on every area at once, right? Like it, clearly taking, having a really good strong foundation model isn't sufficient to necessarily address every 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 um, use case. And so companies that have the second best model or the third best sort of like base model, but that try and enter areas where the other companies aren't necessarily competing, will have a better time just by virtue of focusing on the data and the pragmatics of that particular area. So what I think will be happening over the next few years is there won't necessarily be a Cambrian explosion of like large scale language modeling companies in terms of building the base models, but there'll be, I think, more than two or three that will be servicing different areas that will grow into their own strengths. Um, and if there's a winner's take all situation that will be by virtue of them either merging or um, you know, a monopoly forming, which, you know, I think we also would like for regulatory reasons not to, not to see, um, rather than just by virtue of someone having a significant head start. Exciting time to be in this space, that's for sure. Thank you so much, uh, Alan, for your question. Thanks, Ed. And uh, the next question comes from Maureen. You can unmute yourself and ask it directly. or I'll do it for you. So Ed, you highlighted the difference between production cycle in big companies versus startups. Mariam is asking, what makes a good infrastructure for deploying ML models? I'm like woefully underqualified to answer this question. I mean, I should specify my background is that of, of, of research. And, and I, when I was in research, as I said, we piggybacked on the excellent engineering work of research engineers to really help us scale. And increasingly researchers have to sort of actually think about like the model architecture and, and the and the, the the data regime to to focus on on leveraging scalability. But that's that wasn't something that I necessarily um, had to do that much myself at, at, at the point when I was doing primarily research. And again, within the business, I came to cohere. And we have an excellent sort of like infrastructure team. We have an excellent sort of like foundations team that have built the framework for training these and then uh, serving these models at scale. And so it's not uh, necessary for me to have like extremely well-defined expertise in this. So the very short answer is my, I, I, I can compliment what these people bring to the table, but fortunately I can rely on the expertise and, and not you know in a good position to answer that question. Thank you for this lovely and honest answer. Um, next question comes from Pranay. You should do everything. Yeah. All right, so I think this might be a little bit of a stupid question, but what do you think about using transformer architecture to improve transformer architecture? Maybe by engineering prompts to, so you can query questions about mathematical proofs where like the knowledge base backing the model is a corpus of mathematical statements under proofs. I mean, so first, I don't think that's a stupid question at all. That sounds very interesting. There are no, there are they like there are there are simple questions, but there there aren't any uh, completely stupid questions. And that, by any measure, was not a stupid one. I think it's an interesting research topic. So, um, you're asking why not use like several networks, for example, have one one model learn to prompt another. And so this reminds me a little bit. There's been a lot of work on using networks to sort of condition other networks, um, going back to work by Schmidt, who were on slow and fast learning, which was probably some of the early meta learning papers. I think that was with Seb Hockwriter. Um, there's obviously been work um, by Quack Lee and colleagues at Facebook, at Google <laughs> on hyper networks where you have networks predicting the parameters or modulating the parameters of other networks. And what you're proposing sounds a little bit like that, except in transformer land. So let's pretend that you have one network conditioning the activations of another via discrete layer, via language as a modality. Um, I'm trying to think if that's actually been sort of, that sounds like this, like there's been work around that kind of topic. Um, but I guess, yes, there's work, there's work on, on uh, hierarchical reinforcement learning with language as a sort of, um, command medium. So Chelsea Finn's lab had a what I describe as a position paper where they showed that feudal reinforcement learning could be defined in such a way that the meta controller, and if, if you're not familiar with feudal reinforcement learning, you, instead of having a single policy acting on an environment, you sort of have a, a meta controller that sort of, sort of works at a higher level abstraction mm -hmm. and then a lower level controller that takes instructions from the meta controller and acts on the world. So to give you an example, a robotic arm 
my need in practice to learn how to sort of like lift a red ball and then a blue ball and then a green ball. And if you just let a single policy direct the control of this robotic arm and try and explore what the right combination of balls is, it's going to take a while because that's exploring all the different ways of actuating moving the arm. And if you factorize that exploration problem such you have, you know, you have a meta controller that gets to output instructions like move the red arm, move the blue, move, sorry, move the red ball, move the blue ball, move the green ball, and the um, controller follows his instructions. The exploration space is equally factorized in that you now just are exploring the different sort of combinations of balls you move and the controller only needs to get good at following the sort of like low level instructions. So using language as an intermediate modality there talk spe speaks to me a lot, like, sorry, it sounds a lot like what you're proposing of having, you know, a complex problem and you have some sort of factorization of a network that's expert at posing problem, at posing questions and a network that's, you know, an expert at answering them and you could train it through some adversarial process. But I don't know any literature that's tried exactly that, which is good news because if anyone's listening to this call and is looking for a research project and you've just proposed something that sounds like something to, to flesh out a bit more and, and, and try. Oh yes, grab it while it's still hot. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, we're moving to the question that was posted by Benjamin. Thank you, Sandra. So uh, in relation to large language models, how do you think that these the, and other forms of generative AI that should be governed going forward? I know that there's ample opportunity to misuse some of these technologies, for example, in terms of uh, polluting uh, information ecosystems uh, via chatbots uh, driven by GPT, providing misinformation and so on. So uh, do you think that guided release strategies and other forms of self-governance, they are enough? Or is this current open source movement of uh, these models uh, stipulating an area that governments, they should more actively move into and, and regulate going forward? Thank you. Yes. It's a really tough question, and it's been a long day. So let me try and think of an intense, something not embarrassing to say. I mean, I I definitely am sympathetic to the need for government regulation. I'm not a strong believer in the fact that you know com like companies will self govern and 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 that open source is a panacea here because you know for example like as I said we as a company need to keep a strategic advantage so we will open source some stuff but probably not release the models or the data because that that's where our strategic advantage lies so even if you're open sourcing a lot of stuff you know there's not complete reproducibility intentionally because it's it's capitalism right um and in other sectors and other outside of technology or even within technology, it's a government and intergovernment and uh, international inter organizations role to provide regulatory frameworks to, to govern, you know, uh, data, privacy, uh, misinformation. And as technology involves in this application, we're going to have to have some creative thinking within those um, within those institutions and in partnership with researchers and partnership with companies to, to create those regulatory frameworks. Um, that sounds like buck passing in a sense, but it, it's meant to be it's like it's just because of the uh, the starting point that companies should look after the interest of their users and and the privacy needs of their users um, and 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 obviously be regulated by by current by current regulations and laws. But um, because of the new use cases emerging, we can't anticipate we can't operate outside of the existence of a regulatory framework without having guidance from governments about what's going to be sort of appropriate or not as these new ca use cases emerge. Thank you, Ed. That wasn't embarrassing at all. all right, Appreciate let me, let me, it. I'll add, I'll add just one final analogy. Like we've seen this operate within self-driving cars, right? So like different sort of like levels of self-driving autonomy have been defined. I, again, don't know the history in, of, of the regulatory mechanisms, but my understanding is that there are that the, the, these different levels are then translating into sort of like legal frameworks per country about who's responsible for accidents. For example, the difference between level two self-driving and level three is that the um, responsibility transfers from you know the driver to the designer of the self-driving mechanism. And so I think something similar probably will happen, for example, regarding this information uh, where we'll have level two sort of generators and level three generators and level three generators are ones where, you know, you're providing suitable assurances that there's factual content that's identifiable 
uh, as a basis for the generation that the, that the system can report and that therefore if misinformation happens it's more on the onus of the system whereas a level two generator could be one where it's like there's a caveat that it's a level two generator and if you decide to trust it um then you know that's that's your responsibility as a user um but those frameworks don't exist yet so i'm, I'm excited to see what comes out of uh, organizations like the wuf and and international uh, organizations that will create this regulatory framework awesome benjamin thanks so much for the question and thank you for your answer and we have time for a final question coming from Jan again Hi, thank you so much. Um, thank you for answering my earlier question as well and other questions. It's been an interesting discussion, actually. Um, I just want to ask a quick, a really quick one. So um, what would you say is the rough percent uh, undergraduates among interns in Cohere currently, um, if you know? And uh, as a follow up to that, I guess, how would an undergraduate stand out um, like when applying for an internship? So um, the answer is I don't know and also it's shifting so like I think uh when you know Phil Blunsom and I and Nils Ramers joined so when we started hiring people who um are focusing have a more of a research background and are focusing on the next stage of innovation at that point most of our interns were probably um you know in undergraduate recent graduates or people who were coming out of master's programs who were focusing more on the SWE MLE internship kind of track we don't actually have an official designation for these things we're definitely taking more of those uh, and, and I can't I can't speak to chances or like the profiles because I don't really have that much um I haven't been looking at that particularly closely what is happening is that as we obviously transition towards wanting to um innovate in different direction than our competitors and produce new modeling or training techniques. We have more and more people with a sort of PhD style background, and that means we're also going to take a different kind of intern as well, uh, namely people doing PhDs and less with an interest of immediately converting them at the end of their internship, but more sort of like bringing in a diverse set of research views into how we can uh, improve and innovate uh, our foundational projects, products and, and their applications. Um, so that that's 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 a very broad answer. It doesn't answer your your question about your chances, but the best thing to do to increase your chances is to apply and then you know impress whoever you're talking to uh, during the interviews. I know that our interview loop is is always improving and it's a very soft touch compared to like big companies, which separately are not really <laughs> recruiting that many interns this season. Um, we we try to you know not sort of like have ten interviews and like just ask people to sort link lists, but I have less visibility on what the actual details of the interview interview process are so uh, best way is to find out I guess is to, to apply sounds good that helps thank you so much you're welcome